greeting sent. Our reading for today is found in Colossians 3, verse 1 to 4. If then you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Well, good morning, uh, Christ Church Midrand, and it is a privilege for me to be opening God's word to us um, this morning uh, to tell you the greatest story uh, that has ever been told, the story of God and us, uh, God and humanity. And for the last few weeks, we've been working our way through a series which is titled Jesus is Enough. Um, and it's based off of a book, a small letter that Paul wrote to uh, this group of Jesus followers called uh, the Colossians, the Colossians, they were staying in a place um, called uh, Colossae. Uh, and so these Christians, uh, these Jesus followers had recently uh, had the story of the gospel. They had heard that there was a man called Jesus uh, who was publicly executed by the Roman government. Uh, that this same Jesus did not remain dead in the grave. He came back to life and that Jesus is Lord um, over their lives and he calls the shots. And so this guys embraced this message uh, and we see in the early chapters of uh, one Colossians chapter one uh, that Paul says, man, I'm so excited for you guys. I have never met you guys, but I know that Epaphras, that's Paul's um, uh, fellow colleague, uh, he preached this gospel to you guys. And I've been so excited since you become Christians that I haven't stopped giving thanks uh, to God for you. And so this is what uh, Paul prays uh, for them, that he thanks God uh, that they have recently um, become Christians. And he prays ceaselessly uh, for them. Uh, but one of the things that happen is that they, this new Christians uh, face a lot of pressure from religious people and from their own lives um, concerning their godliness and the life that they, uh, they live. They look at their lives um, of uh, being recently converted, and it doesn't look so much different from their lives uh, before. There's things that they're battling with uh, from their old way of life, uh, and so they're tempted to think, well, maybe this gospel is not enough. Maybe this Jesus um, is not enough. Maybe we need some sort of religion, uh, some sort of rituals to supplement what Jesus has done. And so Paul writes uh, this letter uh, to encourage them in their new found faith uh, and to uh, just set the record straight with them as to what it means for them uh, to live uh, the Christian life. Uh, so he helps them through as they battle with what it looks like to, um, uh, to live a pleasing uh, life uh, to God. So as we open up our Bible, well, I do hope that you have it open to Colossians chapter 3. We're going to look at those four verses. Uh, and just as we look at those four verses, uh, you need to remember as you approach any passage of scripture that it wasn't written directly to you. Uh, so you need to understand what it meant for them uh, so that you understand what it means for you. So the Bible wasn't written to us, but it was written for us. Um, uh, and so it's going to help us uh, as we navigate our way uh, through this corona-stricken uh, and um, performance-driven uh, life that we live in 2020. So I'm just going to pray that God will help us as we grapple with what it meant for the Colossians and what this um, gospel message that Paul writes means for us. Uh, let me pray for us. So please bow your heads wherever you are and join me as we pray. Father, thank you so much for this, your word. Uh, thank you for the transforming power of your gospel. I do pray that as we dive into that story uh, today, that we will be changed, that we will find new energy uh, from your spirit to live for you. So I do pray that you'd convict uh, someone of their sin, uh, that you lead us closer to you, and that you will increase um, our trust and um, our ability to lean on you and what you have done for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Um, so uh, one of the craziest things uh, happened this uh, previous uh, week. 
Um, and, and for some reason, Facebook algorithm things that I, because I'm a, a, a guy, I'm interested in soccer. So anything from the news of the transfer of, of Messi uh, to any soccer results on Kaiser Chase or all of that stuff that's happening in local uh, soccer, I get uh, a feed of news uh, in, I, I get this news in, in my Facebook feed. Um, and the other day, uh, something quite cool popped up in my feeds. And this is the story of a, a, a famous soccer player, French soccer player by the name of Thierry Henry. I wonder if you know who Thierry Henry is. He played uh, for Arsenal. And so the documentary is titled um, uh, Arsenal Legends. And this uh, time around, they interviewing uh, Thierry uh, Henry. So I clicked and watched this story for a couple of minutes. And it was an interesting story uh, as he outlines uh, his relationship to soccer, how it began, uh, one of the interesting things that he says is that his love for soccer actually stemmed uh, from his dad. Uh, his dad uh, tried out soccer when he was young, but he couldn't make it to professional football. Uh, so he pushed angry enough uh, for him to make it to professional football. But listen to what he says about um, his performance on the field. He says that the very first thing that I wanted was to do was to please my dad. I think... Every other kid, you know, uh, I, I think that's like every other kid, you know. I just wanted him to be proud of me. He always wanted more, referring to his dad. Uh, when I first uh, scored my uh, four goals when I was young, he wanted five. Uh, then I got five. He wouldn't be happy with that because it wasn't six. And I wouldn't even tell you what he would do if, it, if I didn't score at all. It was never enough. It was never enough. Uh, he goes on to talk about how this affected his performance on the field uh, and how he became a people pleaser where he would play to please the crowd. So five minutes he would go at it and he would perform his lungs out and do very well. And then uh, later on he would be unseen uh, for the rest of the game. He notices that he was very inconsistent in his play because he was playing for other people uh, to show uh, to show off uh, his skills, um, I was inconsistent, uh, he says. But I think for me, the words that stuck with me uh, were these words: "It was never enough." Um, and I think they stuck with me because it is so close to home, isn't it? It's so close to how sometimes we feel uh, when it comes to, uh, I guess, maybe our own fathers or the relationships in our life. And uh, most importantly, how uh, sometimes it, um, it's so close to how we feel about our own relationship uh, with God. I don't know if you've ever felt that. If you've ever felt like it is never enough. It's not enough. Um, I, I, I think many of us have been um, at that place. Uh, I like how Brene Brown puts his her finger on it. Uh, Brene Brown is a famous speaker and author. Uh, if you watch TED Talks, you would know who Brené Brown is. Anyway, he wrote a book uh, titled Daring Greatly. And it's in, in this book, in, in the first chapter, he talks about uh, the fact that we live in a culture of scarcity, um, a culture of never enough. And he says that anybody can feel this statement, this statement in just a matter of seconds. Never dot, dot, dot enough. I wonder what that thing is for you that you'd fill those dots with. What is never dot, dot, dot for you? What's never, what do you feel like you lack and you never have enough of? Uh, she continues to say that uh, we always feel like we're never good enough, never perfect enough, never thin enough, never powerful enough, never successful enough, never smart enough, never certain enough, never safe enough, never extraordinary enough. I think for me, I always feel like I'm average, I'm never extraordinary uh, enough in this performance-driven world. I wonder if you've ever felt like that, uh, especially when it comes to your relationship uh, with Jesus. Uh, she goes on to uh, quote another um, famous book, uh, which says, before we even sit up in bed, before our, our feet touch the floor, we are already inadequate, already behind, already losing, already lacking something. And by the time we go 
to bed at night. Our minds are racing with a litany of what we didn't get, um, what we didn't get done that day. Um, we go to sleep burdened by the thoughts and wake up to the revere of lack. This internal condition of scarcity, this mindset of scarcity lives at the very heart of our jealousies, our greed, our prejudice, and our arguments with life. You see how uh, that feeling of never enough uh, goes on to impact the way in which you and I behave, uh, that all of our jealousies, all of our greed, all of our prejudice stems out of this place of feeling like we are never uh, enough. And we uh, take that into our relationship with Jesus where we feel like, man, we can never be uh, enough. We can never be Christian enough, godly enough. We can never um, understand the Bible enough um, or be spiritual enough. We need something uh, to make us feel like we are enough. Uh, Jesus is not enough uh, for us. Jesus is not enough uh, to, uh, to earn us a place as secure children before this um, holy God. I wonder if you've ever felt like you needed to add something uh, to supplement what Jesus likes um, for, for in your life, in your Christian walk. Uh, well, we are going to discover as we dive into our passage uh, something powerful that Paul tells these Christians who felt like they were never enough. Something uh, powerful in our text uh, right here, um, today that Jesus is enough. This is what Paul is going to say to these uh, Christians, that what he has done for us in the past um, is enough. What he will do for us in the future, um, that should impact the way that you and I live in the here and now. Let me say that again, because this is the summary of where we are going in our passage. And I'm going to unpack where I got that from uh, the scripture. So you can put this up on your Facebook uh, page. You can put this up on your Twitter or wherever it is to remember it, that Jesus is enough. Jesus is enough. What he has done for us in the past and what he will do for us in the future should impact the way you and I live in the here and now. That is the summary of what we are going to look at. And we're going to look at it in three uh, uh, points which are connected uh, to um, uh, our summary statement. Uh, the first point is that God has done something big for us. The second point is that um, there is more where that came from. And the last point is that that should impact the here and now. It should have an impact on how we live. God has done something big for us. There's more where that came from. And that should change how we live in the here uh, and now. First of all, uh, God has done something big for us. Let me read that text uh, for us once again. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1. I'm going to read not all the verses, but verse 1, 2, 3. If then Paul speaks to this Christian, uh, and the better thing, uh, the better translation would to, uh, to be, since then uh, you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated, uh, at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, referring to the Christian, referring to these Christians, and your life is hidden with Christ uh, in God. So that's how uh, Paul opens up this section as he, uh, as he presses his finger on these guys uh, and their behavior. Uh, he says, if then you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ uh, is seated. He wants to remind them that God has done something big uh, for them. Uh, God has done something big to change them fundamentally, to change their identity and the core of who they are. You see, through the cross of Jesus, God has put um, the, an end to the old way of how these guys used to live. If you are a Christian, God has done something big for you. He has fundamentally uh, changed your past. Uh, and as he died on that cross, he put an end to your old way of life. And he gave you a, a new life. Uh, that is what uh, it means 
to be a Christian. Uh, his death on the cross uh, cleansed the, 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 the debt that you owed God. Uh, it cleansed the pages of your life. And not only could you start on a new page, but through his resurrection from the grave, the same power that raised God, Jesus from the grave, the same power that God employed as he raised Jesus from the grave is at work in your life uh, to make you live the Christian life. So you start off on a new and clean slate. This is what he has done for you at the cross. But God did not uh, let his son remain dead. He raised him to life. And this life that he now lives um, is... Um, is, uh, is, 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 has enough power to make you live uh, this, uh, um, uh, your new life. So let me, uh, let me read for you what another author, another commentator says as he reflects on what God has done for us in the past, in his death and in his resurrection. Uh, he says that the death he died ended once and for all his experience of living in a context ravaged by human sin and thus in a state of weakness resulting from it. So when Jesus died, he put an end to that old way of life, that old human life that is tainted by sin and that is forever weakened by our sin. When he rose, it was with new power of the spirit and he freed uh, freed from the corruption and the weakness that had previously attended him. Uh, so when Jesus rose, uh, he rose with this power of the Spirit, defeating sin and defeating death once and for all. He did that uh, in the past. And Paul says, and he uses this language, uh, and I'm going to explain it a bit in just a moment, this language uh, to refer to the fact that when Jesus did that, um, he did that for you uh, and for me. Um, notice verses 1 and verses 3. Paul uses these words with Christ. With Christ. We see that also in other um, uh, letters where he uses this word in Christ or with Christ. And this is the simple doctrine which is called uh, the doctrine of the union with Christ. Uh, and simply put, this doctrine teaches that any blessing that you and I experience uh, is because of our union to Christ. Uh, so anything that we experience, any good thing that we experience and taste from God, any blessing that he confers to us can only be possible in our union with Christ. Uh, to use a picture of it, uh, as you read through the Bible, you see that John uses the word of a tree and the branches, the vine and the branches. And he says that unless you are grafted, unless you are connected, unless you are united to uh, the vine, you as the branch can never bear fruit. So that is, unless you are connected and united to Christ, you can never bear the fruit of the Christian life. That is the doctrine of the union with Christ. Um, uh, another picture that it, uh, it uses is the body uh, and the head, especially in Colossians. Uh, that the Christians are part of the body and they are connected and united to the head, which is Christ. And nothing that we do um, can stem out of our own empowering. Everything that we do as Christians, we can only do uh, insofar as we are united um, to Christ. Let me read for you uh, Colossians chapter 2 because it explains this so well. Uh, verse 12 says, uh, we, that is the Christians, the Colossian Christians, uh, the Christians living in 2020, we were buried with him in baptism in which, in which you were also raised with him. Notice that word and language again of being united with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. So in other words, when Christ died, we died with him. When he hung on that cross, you and I hung on with him on the cross, that the wrath of God was poured on us on that cross. We were united uh, to him, with him on that cross. Verse 13, and you who were once dead in your trespasses and the circumcision of your flesh, God, listen to this, made, al made us alive 
made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demand, demands. He set it aside, nailing it um, to the cross. In other words, uh, all that Jesus did as he hung on that cross uh, by the miracle of the God's Holy Spirit is applied to us uh, and God unites us with him uh, such that our record was canceled, such that our sins were canceled, such that when Christ was raised to life, you and I were united to him uh, in that resurrection. Let me just use a picture to uh, bring that home for, for us. Uh, and this picture is a picture, again, I don't watch soccer, but I've noticed how when we watch soccer, uh, we speak about our team. So depending on whether our team is Kaiser Chiefs, I used to be a fan of Kaiser Chiefs, um, or our team is Orlando Perez, or you support the Proteas, um, if you are a South African, or you support the Springboks. Often when we win, uh, we talk about uh, the fact that uh, we don't say my team have won or the Springboks have won. What do we say? We have won. Uh, so even if you haven't played on the field, even if you don't know how to um, uh, kick the um, or toss around the, the, the rugby ball, you say we have won. And I've noticed also that when we have lost, uh, it's never that we lost. It's no, the Springboks have lost or Kaiser Chiefs has done it once again. They have lost. Uh, it's this distancing language of saying those guys did it independently of me. Uh, they lost. But when we win, we say we have won. But you've never even played. Uh, and I think the same idea um, is um, we experience it when you talk about our union with Christ. Uh, and I know this is a weak uh, illustration to bring home this picture of us being united uh, to God. But this is the best I can come up with. Um, when we uh, bring it to Team Jesus, Team Jesus, uh, only Jesus does the action. Only uh, he hangs on that cross. But when he hangs on the cross, we can say we also hang on that cross. When he wins uh, and has get victory over sin, we say we have won. Uh, we have won this victory. Uh, so in other words, what Jesus has done, he did it uh, not only as our representative, uh, but he did it uh, together with us. We can share in the blessings of what God has done because of our union with him. Um, John Calvin, a famous French um, um, theologian, puts it like this. Uh, he says, we are one with the Son of God, that is Jesus, not because he conveys his substance to us. Uh, so in other words, it doesn't mean that we are now uh, divine or that we uh, in some ways have the substance of Jesus, um, but because by the power of the Spirit, he impacts us, he Im impacts us, or rather he imparts us his life and all the blessings which he has received from the Father. Uh, so in our union with him, Jesus gives us um, all the blessings that he has received uh, from the Father. I want you to think about that for uh, a minute. As you think about who Jesus is, uh, that he's eternally uh, with the Father, that they love each other, uh, the Trinity, there's love within the Trinity, the Father loves the Son, the Son loves the Father, the uh, Son is secure with the Father. When Jesus, uh, when God, the Father looks at uh, God, the Son, Jesus, he sees perfection. Uh, so in other words, if we are united to Jesus, it means that the same love that God has um, uh, for his son Jesus uh, is conferred and transferred to us. When God looks at us, he sees the perfection of Jesus Christ. That is amazing news in this performance-driven life that God in the past, because of his cross and his resurrection, has made you and I. If we've trusted in Jesus, he's made us children of God. Um, if I'm a believer in Jesus. I'm the son of God. God looks at me and he's pleased with me, not because I've done anything. In fact, I've done nothing, nix, luto, sepe, uh, to, uh, to, to earn my place as a son. Uh, but because of my union with Christ, God looks at me uh, and sees 
uh, somebody who's perfect, somebody who has obeyed perfectly. What a beautiful picture it is uh, for us. What good news it is for us that we are united uh, to the Son. And because uh, of our unity to Jesus, we can be called children of God. We can be called sons. We receive this new identity uh, as sons of God. Uh, and the beauty of it is that our identity as sons of God is not something that we achieve. Uh, it's something that we receive. It's not something that we work hard for, uh, like Terry Angry, uh, busting ourselves uh, to please the Father. No, it is something that we receive uh, because of our union uh, with with Christ. Because if we try to work hard for it, of course, it will never be uh, enough. But if we receive it, um, it is something uh, that we receive despite um, despite our sin and despite our brokenness. So that's the first point that we see there. What God has done for us in the past is that he's made us his children. He's made us sons of God with a clean slate and with a new power to live for him. That's the first thing. And there's more where that came from. Have a look at verse 4 if you still have your Bibles open. When Christ, verse 4 says, who is your life appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. This is the future. This is where you and I are headed. If we are children of God, we are going to be raised with Christ, bodily, physically, uh, somewhere uh, in the future. In other words, this identity as sons of God uh, will never end. This, um, not even death, will take away uh, this identity that uh, we have in Jesus. Because one day Jesus will come back. One day uh, Jesus will come back in all of his glory. This is what we believe as Christians. And Paul says, on that day, we will be raised in glory. We will be made to look like Jesus in all of his perfection, uh, without any sin, without uh, any uh, brokenness. Uh, so this is what is in store for us uh, as we look forward to the future, that not even death will remove our status as, as sons. And not only that, uh, in the future we will experience fully what it means uh, to be sons um, of God. Um, so, so this is what we see, that this is what is uh, in store for us, that one, God in the past made us uh, his sons. Two, in the future, this is what's in store for us, um, that God will make us remain as his children. Uh, I like the, the, <laughs> the, the, the kind of language that Jesus uses in John's gospel when he says, uh, this sheep uh, God has given to me, um, and nobody can snatch them from me. And nobody can snatch them from me. So in other words, you and I are secure in our sonship uh, with God. We are secure uh, not because of what we have done, but because of what Jesus has done. Because somebody might be sitting there and asking, man, how can you be sure that one day you'll be raised with Jesus? Uh, surely if you look at your lives right now, um, the stuff that you've been getting up to, you can never be sure that you will be uh, with God or you continue in your Christian life. Uh, but the Bible always wants to remove the action away from us. Uh, notice the, the language, the passive language and the passive voice uh, that Paul uses that we will be raised together with Christ. What are you going to do? You are not going to be um, raising yourself. It is a divine act that God will raise you just like he raised Jesus from the dead by the power of his spirit. Uh, so it takes away the action and it takes away the power from you and it places it back onto God who is powerful enough um, to change you and your life. So what if we discovered, we've discovered that in the past God has done something big for us. He's brought us into his family. He's cleaned the slate for us and he's given us new life and power to live um, a, a, this new life. And not only has he done that in the past, in the future, he is has secured um, this life uh, for us. He's secured our sonship and our identity for us, which leads us um, to our last point, 
uh, that if you think about that for a minute, if you are a son and if you are going to remain a son, if, if that's where you had it, then man, that should change the way that you live now. Uh, that should cause you to look at your life and desire to change and change in a gospel-centered way, not in a way that tries to please God more, uh, but in a way that understands that as God looks at you, uh, he's pleased because of what God, what Jesus uh, has done for you. Uh, so how should this impact the way that you and I live? Uh, and I'm going to encourage you to read through that those four verses and notice that there are only two actions, uh, only two imperatives. The indicative, uh, which means um, what God has done, is, is laid out in our first point, point one and two. But the imperatives, the things that you and I should do, are this. There's two things. Uh, one is to set your mind on things that are above. Um, w- the second thing is to seek the things that are above. So set your mind, seek uh, the things that are above. Notice the contrast there between the earthly things and the heavenly things. Obviously, when the Bible talks about the heavenly things, it talks about the things where, um, that belong to the world where God is. The world that is not open to us in the here and now. The world that is going to be open to us when Christ returns. Uh, heavenly things versus earthly things. And next week, we're going to see in our sermon, uh, as Paul outlines for us, what is earthly and what is heavenly. Uh, I don't want to steal from next week's sermon but I do encourage you to go read along because Paul explains what it means to be setting your mind on things that are heavenly, things that are above, seeking those things versus being preoccupied and seeking things um, that are below. So those are the two um, actions that we are called to do, to set our mind on things above, to seek the things of the life to come. Many if you know that you are going to remain the son of God um, to the very end of the ages, in fact, for f- forever, then you ought to be living in the here and now in the view of that. Uh, you need to be living, we need to be living in view um, of that. And can I say something, uh, which is why Paul was going against some of the false teaching of those false re- religions, that unless you and I, understand the first two points unless we understand what god has done for us in the past and what he's going to do in the future we are going to continually uh, live in our sinful ways and let me let me put it uh, differently to the degree that you and i understand the gospel uh, we are uh, we are never going to uh, to change if you and i don't understand what god has done for us in the gospel we are never going to change uh, deeply and truly in our lives, we are going to always try to use religion um, to fill that void uh, because Jesus uh, we, is not uh, enough for us. This is why Paul was going against this Colossian heresy that was teaching these Christians that man, Jesus is not enough. You need to uh, be circumcised, you need to observe this ritual and that ritual to supplement uh, Jesus. Religion will fill the void for you. And I think for many of us as Christians, uh, religion takes different forms. Uh, Bible study attendance, church attendance, giving money to the church, whatever good stuff. All those things are good things, but they don't earn you a place as a child. They don't, they're not things that you can do um, to achieve your status as a son. Remember, our status is not something that we achieve. It's something that we receive. Uh, so often we run to religion uh, to try to live out a godly life. Uh, but Paul would remind us that we can't do that. And the only way to set your mind on things above, the only way to seek the things above, is to understand what God has done for you and for me. Now sometimes religion takes a different form. Uh, and it's not church attendance. It's not... Um, a Bible study attendance, it's not giving money to the church, but it comes in as a, um, when you become your own self-appointed priest. Uh, let me tell you what I mean by that. Um, often 
in my married life, I've seen a pattern in my behavior. Whenever some, my wife confronts me about a very serious sin in my life or a, a shortcoming, when she brings it up, no matter how nice she brings it up, I always become defensive. Um, I always activate my inner priest to say, man, I don't think you as bad as she says you are. I become my own judge, my own lawyer, and my own priest. priest. And that becomes my religion of saying, y y y you're not that bad. You're not uh, as bad as she, she says you are. Uh, so we either shift the blame of um, our sin and our brokenness, or not only do we uh, shift our blame, we become defensive, or we, we kind of downplay uh, the sin uh, in our life. Um, but to, for us to set our mind on what uh, on heavenly things uh, means that we need to come uh, to the realization of how sinful we are and how sin still is active in our lives. And unless we are secure in the fact that God has made us sons in the past, we will never be able uh, to face up to the sin that still exists in our life, that eat away um, at our lives. Um, set your mind on things above, Paul reminds these Christians. And one commentator says that to set your mind on things above doesn't purely uh, mean your, mind, your, your mental and intellectual process, but to, um, it refers to a more fundamental orientation of the will. Uh, so it means uh, fundamentally reorientating our will to love the things that God loves, to love the things that our Father loves. But this true change, this true fundamental um, um, reorientation of our mind can only happen uh, as we believe the gospel, can only happen when we realize what God has done for us. Now somebody said that the, 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 the sin that is most destructive in our lives is the one that we are most defensive of. The sin that's most destructive in your life right now is the one that you are most defensive about. Now, the reason why we're defensive uh, is because of that um, desire to, um, to, to supplement what we lack, to not come to the realization that uh, we lack something, we're not as perfect as we should be, um, and we try to make ourselves perfect by saying, no, that, that's not bad enough. That, 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 that can't be that bad. Um, but unless we come to the place where we realize God has made us his sons, God has raised us alive with, with Jesus, uh, we will always try to be our own priest, um, setting up our own religion, uh, trying to uh, make ourselves clean before God uh, because we don't truly understand that he has made us clean. And the only way for us to put to death, which is the next section that Paul goes into in verse 5 uh, following, to put to death sin in our life is by realizing what God has done uh, for us. Um, to constantly be applying the gospel to our lives. Now, before I end it off, I just want to tell you, a story about my experiences living in Cape Town. Before I came to Midland, I was staying in Musenberg, Cape Town. It is a great place to stay, uh, but can I say that, that that wind from Cape Town is not God-ordained? In fact, it is a picture of a fallen world, of living in a broken world. It is sandy, it is cold, it is irritating. You can hear the wind at night. I was staying in the rest called, a rest called Fort House, and every night the wind will blow on my window. In fact, if you walked during the day, during uh, um, one of the winds, if you smiled long enough, you will have sand all over in your mouth. Uh, the mountain was um, like a funnel that funneled all that wind uh, into, uh, into Musenberg, uh, and it will flow um, into, into the rest of, uh, of Cape Town. Um, and so powerful is the wind in, in Cape Town that there's a place called Sea Winds because the wind is that powerful there. And there's another place called 
Chrome Boom. Now, I think, I'm not 100% sure, um, but the, the word Chrome Boom simply means, I'm 100% sure of this, it simply means, um, I've I got to see in Africans, I can't speak a word of Africans, but it means crooked trees. Uh, so I'm 100% sure of that, but I may not be 100% sure that it was named the um, crooked trees because the trees there grow crooked. Now, I've seen those trees there. I think that's why they called it Chrome Boom, because the trees go sideways uh, towards the direction where the wind is, is flowing. Now, I would see this every Saturday as we drove through the M5. I would be fascinated with these trees that were growing uh, sideways. Uh, and those trees were shaped by the constant winds that were blowing, the slow, constant years and years of wind blowing uh, towards one direction. It was inevitable that no matter how stubborn the tree was, it was going to bend uh, to the shape of the, um, the wind. Now, in many ways, the way God works in our lives is like this mighty wind that is constantly blowing to reshape us into who God wants us to be. That no matter how stubborn your will is, God, by his grace, is going to constantly and surely bend it into his will. No matter how self-centered, sin-loving you are, God, by his grace, as you continually remember the gospel, will bend you into his shape. So you might be looking at your life right now and thinking, man, um, Jesus is not um, enough for me. I mean, look at my life. I will never change such and such a sin. <laughs> well, God wants you to remember that Jesus is enough. Uh, he is enough um, to change. You might be defensive when your husband or wife uh, confront you about a sin uh, in your life. Well, Jesus is enough for you. His grace in, is enough uh, to change you. Maybe you've been in lockdown and you've been finding yourself battling uh, with some kind of sin that you thought you had defeated, whether it's pornography or uh, perhaps you're struggling with impatience. Uh, you just cannot remain patient in another Zoom call. You just want to lash out at your colleagues. Um, it, people at work are probably um, hating you and thinking that you are an impatient uh, person. Well, Jesus is enough. Uh, to change you. His power is enough to change that anger as you begin to realize that, man, I'm a loved child of God. I don't have to assert myself or always feel like things have to go my way. Jesus is enough to change you. Some of us are blind to the sin that is still operating in our lives. Uh, we are holier than thou, and people don't like us because of this. We have all the right answers. We come to Bible study but every now and again, we see our relationships not working because we haven't rested in what Jesus has done uh, for us. We are holier than thou. We thrive by making other fe people feel worse than ourselves. That, that's what validates us. Well, I need you and I need to be reminded that there's hope for people like you and I. Uh, there's hope for us. And Jesus has done so much for us uh, to make us acceptable be before God. And as we begin to apply the truth year and year into our life through repentance and faith and running back to him, we will be bent uh, into the shape that God wants us uh, to be bent to. Uh, so can I encourage you to uh, consider joining us next week as we unpack what that gospel looks like as we apply it into our lives. But I just want to leave you with three questions that are going to help you understand what God has done for us in the past and how and what he has done he's going to do in the future and how that impacts your life in the here and now. Three questions uh, to consider uh, to apply this truth to your life. Number one, is there somebody in your life that speaks um, into your life? Is there somebody who convicts you of sin? Uh, somebody who can be bold enough to tell you when you are wrong? That's the first question. The second question is, um, what are you most likely um, to be defensive about when somebody confronts you with that thing? What are you most likely to be defensive about? And the third thing, uh, and our last thing, 
what would it look like for you to understand that God loves you? How would that lead you to repentance? What would it look like for you in that sin, the one that you confronted with, if you were to trust that God has made you his son? How will that transform your life this week? So I hope you will grapple with those three questions. I'm going to lead us in prayer. Please join us again next week as we look at another a week of Jesus is enough and how that practically impacts our lives. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for all that Jesus has done to make us um, acceptable before you. I pray that that would become uh, the thing that motivates us to live a godly and Christian life. So please help us uh, to lean on, on, on that, to lean on what Jesus has done and that gospel, uh, that that gospel would transform um, our very wills, would fundamentally transform us to be more like your son Jesus. So please help us this week as we grapple with sin to remember that Jesus is enough. This we pray in his name and for our good. Amen.